Hello, brothers and sisters, Church of the Living God, and good morning. Go ahead and get your authorized version of the scriptures. This video is, is stemming upon um, some information given to me by a dearly, dearly beloved sister in an email and looking at some of the comments on the previous video that uh, was done. In this video, I'm um, going to be addressing children. More rather, what the scripture has to say of such things. I also have to confess unto you that I'm kind of struggling with doing this video because I can't have kids. I can't have children. Okay, I do not have children. Okay? But, can sure look into the scriptures and go over this with you, even though I myself have no children and cannot have children. Okay? Well, we're going to look into this. Now, this is going to be uh, as detailed as a sinner who is chief high was allowed to um, to make it. And uh, hopefully this will be informative and helpful unto some of us. Because we got to remember, brethren, the children of today, this generation that is being brought up today, is a generation void of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. One second, one second. Okay, sorry about that, brethren. I want to read to you a, a very quick quote from this book. Okay? Okay, I want to read to you a quote on page 142. For I would not have it lost sight of that our chief concern must be to mold the people to our purposes. Doubtless, the first generation will not be wholly ours, but the second will nearly belong to us, and the third entirely. From the mouth of the Jesuits, from the Jesuits themselves, who are training, teaching the children of today. A lot of you might be saying, well, Brad, that's just in religious or private schools. No, no. you got to remember what the, the goal of the Jesuit is to bring everyone under the headship of Rome. Okay? You have to remember that. And to be quite frank with you, um, you're, you're a fool if you think that the Jesuit order has not infiltrated the public school sector. Okay? You're a fool. You're an absolute fool if you think that that they haven't, that it's just uh, relegated to religious and private institutions. You're a fool. You're a fool, okay? Case in point, evolution. I rest my case on that. But, with that in the air, get your authorized version of the scriptures, okay? Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. You are expected to follow along in the scriptures as we go, and I will speak to you as though you are following along in the scriptures, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 21, beginning at verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, Note it says man, not parent. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. 
He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now right away, <laughs> right away, um, people are like, wow, that's pretty intense. The point being, who is to be the primary objective in raising, in raising a child or in, uh, in a marriage or in a family? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. In the beginning, God, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, must be first and foremost in anything we do, including the raising of children. Now this is a this is an extreme example. Yes. Yes. Under a different dispensation. Yes. We do not do that today. Obviously, in this dispensation. But of course not. Okay? The point being for our instruction in righteousness. Okay? Why was this son rebellious against his father and mother? They weren't, he wasn't listening to his father or his mother. Okay? Why was that? Why was he rebellious? Maybe because, um, maybe because they missed a step somewhere? Something like that? I don't know. But the point is, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, has to be first and foremost in anything that we undertake. Okay? in anything we undertake, including the raising of children, okay? Including the raising of children. Go to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, verses 1 on to verse 6. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor than silver and gold. A good name. A good name. Oh, say that you belong unto the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ, God our Father, dwelleth within you. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. A good name. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches of the church of the living God, Christ within you, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The favor of the Lord, the grace of our Lord. Hmm, interesting, huh? The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is maker of them all. A prudent man Foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. Someone who is prudent is prudent in manners of the Lord. Okay? Being having the fear of the Lord is equated with prudence. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. Understanding, removing uh, to depart from evil, okay? But the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, look at the contrasts in verses, between verses 1 and 5, okay? Look at that. Look at that, all right? A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. To be of the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Good name, okay? And loving favor rather than silver and gold. Okay? 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, His favor upon you, is far better than anything of silver and gold that come from this world. Okay? The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is maker of them all. Even you lost people. You <laughs> professed atheists. The Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is your God, whether you like it or not. A prudent man, one who fears the Lord, foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. See, a lot of people right away think of riches like this. No, 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 no. Think outside the box on that one there, brother, sister. It's a little bit deeper than just tangible. His riches. What are the riches of the Lord? His righteousness is imputed unto you. His righteousness. His righteousness. Because you came to him broken, contrite, and in the fear of the Lord, you cried out to him for your salvation. And if the Lord has saved you, he has imputed his righteousness unto you. Is there anything more? Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Oh, the depths of the riches. Huh? Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. Okay? Someone who fears the Lord and someone who is of the world. Okay? Do you see the, con you see the contrast here? One who is, um, who is right with the Lord and one who is of the world. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go. He should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. In the way he should go. The way any child should go is the path of the cross to our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. But what do they tell you? <laughs> what about these devils, huh? Yeah. 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 Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we will be reading verses 1 on to verse 4. Okay? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And also you can reference this in, the, in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verses 20 and 21. Children. Obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Lest they be discouraged. And we see in the scripture, okay, that uh, daddy and mommy are the ones who are to bring up the children. In what? In the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay. So, obviously, that's not happening today, is that? No. There are some of the Church of the Living God 
Brother Brian, um, a brother in Canada who is also raising his two children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, there are several of you out there, I hope, <laughs> who are doing the same. Okay? All right? Now, go to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20, verses 1 on to verse 11. In Proverbs chapter 20. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion. Whoso provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. The fear of, of a king is as the roaring of a lion. Hmm. Lion of the tribe of Judah by any chance? Hmm. It is an honor for a man to cease from strife. Understanding is to depart from evil. Fear the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. But every fool who has said in his heart there is no God will be meddling. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. But a man of understanding will draw it out. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. See, I can only imagine as being a father, obviously, your responsibilities as a father need to be number one unto our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Your help meet and your children. Okay? Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. It's often very telling to me when someone uh, feels the need to boast themselves of what they do actually proves that you're quite lacking in those very areas that you're boasting yourself. Isn't that interesting? The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Mm. Now up to verse 7. Okay. Verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strang, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. How many times have, have you heard of tales of drunken father or mother abusing their children in a drunken state? What about verse 3? It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. Getting into other people's affairs that are not your own business. And, t and passing that down to their children to be busybodies, so to say. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold, verse 4. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. Unfortunately, there is some very real legitimacy to those who have children just for the sake to live off of the government. I wish that were an exaggeration. You can look on your own time about the uh, legitimacy of that. That yes, uh, I, apparently in West Virginia, uh, that's very prevalent, apparently, okay? Where people will just have children in order to get more money from the government? And then verse six. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. 
But a faithful man, who can find? Faithful. Faithful to the Lord first. But see, you take the Lord out of the equation. Ta-da! Verse 8. A king that sitteth in the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil with his eyes. Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Dishonesty here, right? Uh, verse 10. Divers weights and divers measures, both of them are alike an abomination of the Lord. Divers weights and divers measures. Falsifying. Cheating people. Tie that verse in with verse 4. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. Verse 10. Divers weights and divers measures, both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. Even a child is known by his doings. Whether his work be pure and whether it be right. Child is known by his own doings. And note what it says here, and note what it does not say. Whether his work be pure, and whether it be right. Now, the, um, that verse is also alluding to what is the opposite. If a child is known by his doings, whether they be pure or whether they be right, his doings, huh? What is the opposite to that? And how does a child arrive at that? By how they are instructed by daddy and mommy. In the admonition of the scriptures, in the admonition of the Lord. And again, noting the contrasts in Proverbs 20, verses 1 on to verse 11. You see? Now go to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. See... It takes a father and a mother to raise children. But because, especially, I, I'm using America as my example. Okay, I'm an American. Okay, and look at my nation. Okay. Marriage in America is something as if it were a disposable razor. They get married under the wrong pretenses. Uh, they mistake um, lust for love, affection for endearment, and then they get married, and then if they find any disfavor, uh, dis uh, dissatisfaction or whatever, toss it away as if it were a disposable razor, right? But then, what happens when children are involved? A lot of times, as you uh, you can look this up on your own time, uh, the children of divorce. What happens to the children of divorce? They're like fought over uh, with a tug of war kind of thing, used as leverage against one and the other. Does the Lord have anything to say about that? Malachi chapter two, verses eleven on verse seventeen. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God, going after other gods instead of the Lord, obviously. <coughs> Make your part. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, 
The master and the scholar. <laughs> the master and the scholar. Yeah. Out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet she is thy companion, and the wife of thy covenant. You know, when you get married, you're making a covenant. You, you know that, right? You do know that. Hopefully you do. And the Lord does not like putting away. Now, there are, re there are um, reasons and, uh, that you can divorce. Okay, we're not going to get into that in this video. But there are scriptural grounds for divorce, for putting away, yes. Okay, yes. Catholics are really big in staying together, even when you got a, a husband who likes for his own amusement to get drunk on alcohol and beat the snot out of his wife and children. And these Catholics, like, stay with him no matter what. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, here's what the scriptures say. Yet ye say, Wherefore? Verse 14. Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore, one? That he might seek a godly seed a godly seed so daddy and mommy are to bring up the children in nurture and admonition of the Lord to bring up what a godly seed hence having the Lord as the main focus of not only your life but your marriage and the raising of your children And in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 21, the point is that the Lord is to be the primary and the first uh, thing of all other things. Because if not, look what happens. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him, when ye say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. Think about what's happening today. And he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of judgment? Yeah, where is the God of judgment, right? See, daddy and mommy are the ones who are supposed to raise the children. Now there are exceptions. For example, uh, a mother will die, may die, or a father may die, okay? But when two decide to part ways, okay? Just, and just because of a disposable nature, who suffers? The kids, the children. The children do. The children do. Go to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. 
Proverbs chapter 31. Verses 1 on to 31. Yeah, we're going to read this whole thing. Can you handle it? The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Gluttony. <laughs> um, giving yourself over to riches. Power hungry, that kind of thing. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Verses 8 and 9. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such are as appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Now from verses 1 on to verse 9, it's talking about the man. The Proverbs 31 man. Verse 4, verse 3 and 4. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Perfect example. Solomon. He gave his way unto women. Okay? He was a lover of many strange women. And look what happened. Because he went on to these strange women. They turned his heart away from following the Lord his God. Didn't they? Didn't they? And he built all these abominations for his multitude of wives. He had over a thousand women at his disposal. <laughs> wow. Okay. It is not for kings, Ola Mule. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Why? Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment, the judgment of any of the afflicted. Verses 8 and 9. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Poor and needy. Not just, again, not just poor meaning without finance. Poor and needy. Lost people who are poor and needy. Yet they think they have much riches, don't they? Don't they? Now, from verses 10 on to verse 31, okay? The role of the man. Proverbs chapter 31, woman. Now, I have two videos of the woman of God where we get into this quite uh, in depth. I'm going to link those two videos in the uh, description box of this one. So I'm not going to totally expound way too deeply on this. But, okay, Proverbs 31 begins with the man and with the woman. Okay? Man and woman. Daddy and mommy to raise the children. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. And I'll tell you what, brethren. I'll tell you what. As a man... You have a woman, a wife, who fears the Lord. Speaking, of course, from, <laughs> from the perspective of man. Yeah. Amen, brother? Right? Amen? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he have no need of spoil. Have no need of spoil. Other things 
You don't need to go outside of your marriage or anything. You don't need these other things. Do you? Do we? She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax, and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. See, scriptures don't teach against a woman working. But it's in within the context of the home. Not going out like we men to make a living outside, doing secular things, working at a job or whatever. The woman has a specific job, but yet God has no problem with the woman. Let's continue. Verse 15. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold to the staff. A spindle, sewing kind of things. For example, my wife, she crochets, makes scarves and that kind of stuff. Okay? See, the Lord is not against a woman having an income. The Lord is against a woman going outside of the house to have that income. Okay? And look what's happened as a result of that. Of people getting away from the scriptures and turning everything like this. Huh? Look what's happened because of it. Verse 20. She stretcheth out her hands to the poor, her hand, excuse me, to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy, the poor needy, the poor needy. Yes, in this context, poor needy, yes, those who are without uh, food covering, okay? But also, for us today, for our instruction in righteousness, she stretcheth out her hand to the poor, those who are lost and needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. Scarlet, red. All her, house, all her household are clothed with scarlet. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be, uh, you're covered in the blood, you know, uh, your sin washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm, interesting. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Note verse 21 and 22, scarlet and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Oh, and I know several of you sisters out there. I know of several of you. You do open your mouth with wisdom, the fear of the Lord. My wife, your sister, does the same thing. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Paul talks about that, about how these false prophet type guys go from um, go to lead captive silly women laden with sins. And he also talks about how they are busybodies going from house to house, talking about the women. 
Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest, excellest them all. Favor is deceitful. What kind of favor? We already saw that the favor of the Lord is to be well uh, prized more than gold and silver. Gold and silver attributed unto this world. So favor is deceitful. And beauty is vain. Favor, favor of the world. And beauty is vain. Because guess what, ladies? You're going to get old. Things are going to sag. Unless you go to the world and have Botox injections and, and, and plastic surgery, nonetheless, nonetheless, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And You, you can come across, um, beg your pardon, making an example, beg your pardon. You can come across a dynamite, hot looking woman out there, oh, so beautiful. Flesh, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. Then you start talking to them. <laughs> But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. There ain't nothing more prettier on this earth than a woman that feareth the Lord. Because remember, the woman is the glory of men, is the glory of man. Because woman means of man. And a woman that feareth the Lord I know of several of you. Nothing quite compares to that beauty here that we can see. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Let her own works praise her in the gates. Give her the fruit of her hands. Again, I'm going to be linking those two uh, videos, The Woman of God, in this video. Okay? Please watch them, especially if you're a woman, uh, newly saved, or are seeking the Lord. Okay? All right? So, in, in context... In Proverbs chapter 31, we see what is uh, expected of the man, verses 1 on verse 9, and verses 10 on verse 31, what is expected of the woman. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And here is what the devil and these clowns, Catholicism, Jesuits, Catholicism, they're one and the same. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 on to verse 25. And the Lord God said, Oh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 on to verse 25. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Now you look at this verse in some of the Bibles. <laughs> wow. Wow. They they uh, they really like to mess with that one. They really like. You, you check that out on Bible Hub or whatever it is. Uh, you check that verse out in the Bibles. Oh wow. <laughs> wow. Let's continue. Verse 19. 
And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. What does woman mean? Again, defined right here. Because she was taken of man. Now, oh, I've shared this with feminazis out there. Whoa! Whoa! Oh, wow! <laughs> wow! <laughs> oh, yeah, and feminazis. You know, God, woman, pet, uh, God, woman, children, pet, man. That's what a feminist says. God says, God, man, woman, children. Okay? But like I said, I've, I've brought this up to a feminist before. And oh, wow! <laughs> wow. Wow. Beg your pardon. Let's continue. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So... In verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That is not just talking in the physical sense. Okay? That's not talking in the, not just alone, talking in the physical sense. My wife and I are one flesh. Okay? We have the same spirit. We serve the same Lord. Okay? Okay? God at the head. God at the head. Okay? And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Again, right there. Between a man and a wife. Um, beg your pardon for this. You ought not to be ashamed of y'all being naked around each other. There's no shame there. There ought not to be shame. But see, when you go outside of that, yeah, there's a lot of shame, isn't there? But now, look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 on to verse 19. Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 on to verse 19. We all know Satan goes to Eve. Where was Adam? We don't know, okay? Satan tempts Eve. Eve gets a little freaked, adds to scripture, and Satan's like, hey, ye shall not surely die. For the day ye eat thereof, God doth know that your eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I'm going to be touching on that in a video coming whenever uh, about manipulation as found within the scriptures only. Okay, But we all know that. All right? We also know about the prophecy given on, of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, God manifest in the flesh. Okay, We also know about that. But we're picking up on to verse 16, on to verse 19 in Genesis chapter 3. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. That gives us to believe that for you ladies, you women out there, excuse me, um, childbirth at the beginning was not to be as horrific apparently as it is for you today to bear children. 
and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Okay? That was before sin came in. That was before Adam and Eve disobeyed and brought in sin. Okay? That was before. Obviously. Obviously. So, those being one flesh, for our example and our instruction in righteousness today, having God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, as the head of our marriage. One flesh. One flesh. And no shame between them. But see, here in Genesis chapter 3, Verse 16, And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, it is suggested in Genesis chapter 2 that the bond of man and wife was different, obviously, before sin came in. But we get that. Now that sin is in the world because of this, okay, the husband is to rule over the wife. Again, you talk about this with some feminists sometimes. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. You ain't lived yet there, <laughs> cousin. Till you... <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Okay. Let's continue. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Ah. See... When Eve ate the fruit, she brought the fruit to her husband, Adam. Adam ought to have... What do what you smack that out of her hand? What are you doing? What are you doing? He didn't do that. He didn't do that. He hearkened unto his wife, who disobeyed at the temptation of Satan. But remember, Satan wasn't holding a gun at her head. Okay? So, right there, man is to be the head. Even, even before sin was in the world, because it's in verse 18, uh, Genesis chapter 2, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Okay? I know a lot of women have a big problem with that, but I'm going to tell you your problem ain't with his messenger. Your problem is with the Lord himself and his book. <laughs> That's why some of you like to go to a Bible instead. Yeah. 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 Verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Hence, what we have today. Man is, to, is the head of the wife. And when that is messed with, okay, when that is messed with, go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 9 on to verse 12.
Uh, let's read verses 8 on to verse 12 in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Excuse me. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Which what woman means. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Oh, and if any of you women out there have any feminazi tendencies within you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, and I, this gets answered in the uh, two videos I'm going to be uh, about the woman of God. So, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. In the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. See, women, women bear children. Hence, without the woman, man can't exist. But, as we have just saw, woman was created for man, not man for the woman. And the Jesuit order, Catholicism, Satan and his church, which is Roman Catholicism and his army, the Jesuits, have spent centuries messing that up. And there are those out there who <laughs> truly believe that there can be a turnaround. And things can be revived now, this late of an hour. Y'all crazy. You think that. Y'all crazy. This world is too far gone. Go now to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. You know, you men out there, don't get, don't get all high, high and mighty on yourself. Okay? Yes, the man is the head of the wife. But see, what happens is there are people out there who will use religion as a crutch and use that to manipulate and will use that to puff themselves up. How many of you have seen that? How many of you know of that kind of thing? These Baptist guys, like the Jack Hiles types, who probably, uh, probably smacked his wife around Okay? And probably smacked his children around. Okay? Not because of discipline onto the children. Okay? But just because he had a bad day. There are those out there, men, who will take what we're looking at that and use that to, um, to puff up themselves and to justify sin. Lord rebuke you. Those types of people, I'd like to sick my beloved friend from England on them. It's like, here, you got your pent-up anger? Go after these people who do that. Yeah. Yeah. You call yourself a Christian and going on and using these kinds of things to justify your own sinful actions against your wife and your children, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. I know of some devils who would love to get their hands on you. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 on to verse 15. 
I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without doubting. Look at that. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, oh, excuse me, without wrath and doubting. So see, it begins with the man. We are to pray everywhere. Lifting up holy hands, separate, other, without wrath, because anger resteth in the bosom of fools, and doubting, being an un unstable man. I like, in like manner also, that, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Modest apparel. That a woman dress as a lady with dresses beyond the knee. Okay, covering up certain parts. Same with men. Same with us guys, okay? Wearing these disgusting sausage wrapper pants and the, you know, stuff that's, ugh, it's disgusting. Beg your pardon. You go out here today, you know, in this hot weather, you have women wearing these short shorts that are only that much. It's, it's grotesque, it's disgusting. And what happens? You, you see that, they blame you for looking at them because they're a piece of meat advertising something that should not be for sale. Or is it? You don't know, right? And you know what's worse? When you see children, 11-year-old girls dressing in that same manner. Because, hey, mommy's doing it. And people wonder why there's such a problem with pedophilia. Huh? Because evil is good and good is evil. That's what America teaches. That's what the Jesuits teach America through their school systems. It's all okay. It's okay for an 11-year-old girl to wear little short shorts like that. It's disgusting. And it is all about the children. The Jesuits are going after the children. This generation that is being brought up now, this is who they are attacking. And as we have already looked at at the beginning of this video, First generation isn't going to be the Jesuits. The second generation, midway. The third generation, going to belong to the Jesuit order. To Satan. And look at America today, people. And you of other nations, my brethren, sisters of other nations, please, go right ahead. It's okay. I, we understand. Those of us at the Church of the Living God who are in America, we get it. Yeah, America is horrible. Yes, we know that. You're not going to offend us of the Church of the Living God, your brethren and sister, sisters in America. You're not going to offend us when you state the truth to us. Uh, yeah, Brad, your, your nation is pretty... Woo -hoo -hoo. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. We know. We know. We get this. Your nation ain't that much better, but yeah, we 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 know about our nation. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And it's made worse by these people like that Phil Robinson and all these cell evangelist people. It's just made worse and worse. <clears throat> Thank you, part. Let's continue. Verse ten. But which becometh 
women professing godliness with good works. Let's read verse 9 and 10 because my little rabbit trail rant kind of lost that for a second. Hold on. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Oh, yeah. And you go on YouTube and you see these women preachers. Oh, my, uh, my, uh, my dear friend is, <laughs> he, uh, for some reason, he finds these weird people and he'll, he'll, he'll share some with me. It's like, wow, man. And he'll, 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 he'll you know, drop scripture verses and get whoo, attacked sometimes unmercifully but yeah yeah but i suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence and this to usurp authority over the man this is what satan has been doing through feminism case in point look at our president kamala harris a jesuit Okay? Okay? Children are your oppressors and women rule over you. Form of judgment. Judgment on our nation of a woman being the ruler. So again, people, smoking Joe. Ne never mind him. Okay? He, he, for, forget about smoking Joe. The f it's uh, Kamala Harris, okay? Just psst, get smoking Joe out of your mind. It's Kamala Harris, okay? That's who the Jesuits want. That's who the Jesuits want. That's whom the Lord is allowing to be put in charge for judgment against America, okay? Verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, childbearing, that's what Paul was referring to in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verses uh, 8 through 12, okay? See, th this, this is what God has ordained. This is what God wants for us, okay? The man is the head of the wife, okay? God, man, wife, children. But see, Satan, through feminism and whatever else he's doing, it's God, meaning himself, woman, children, pet, and man. Five. And that's something, huh? But see, what we have looked at thus far is what God wants. Especially in Proverbs chapter 31 and also looking at Malachi, okay? It takes daddy and mommy. There are some circumstances where one die or what, whatever. Yes, unfortunately, divorce does happen. And some for proper reasons, for fornication and if uh, uh, abuse, abuse, okay? Catholics want to tell you that even if your husband is smacking you around at his whim and justifying it through the uh, teachings of Mystery Babylon, Roman Catholicism, yeah, uh, they want to tell you to stay with them. Yeah, I don't think so. But what happens when you break away from that? Hmm? What happens when you break away from that, also break away from admonishing your children, bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? 
I, I, I've heard stories of people who discipline their children, you know, with the belt or go pick yourself a twitch off the tree there, boy. I'm going to whoop you because you've done wrong. Okay? We'll, we'll look at that in Scripture here in a little bit. But nowadays, if someone, you know, takes their hand and smacks their son or daughter on the behind because they misbehaved, you got some of these devil twits out there who will turn you in to the police and call you a criminal for you uh, disciplining your child, your son or daughter. See, have you ever wondered why God, as a judgment against his people Israel in the Old Testament, why God allowed his people to go cannibal and to eat their own children? Yes, he did allow that to happen as a judgment against them. Have you ever thought about that? Could it be that in the sake of the name of the children that a lot of the parents of today who are not of the church of the living God have made little idols of their children? You don't say, do you? Yeah, trying to live vicariously through their children. You ever heard that one? Can you not see that in the lost? And unfortunately, and some that are actually of the church of the living God, ugh. Ugh. What happens when we stray away from what the Lord has said? <laughs> Look outside your door, Brad. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Proverbs chapter 30. What happens when you coddle these children? Give them every single thing at their back. Oh, my little angel is so innocent. All your children ain't innocent. Okay? There is an age when a child will understand whatever that age is, we do not know. Depends on the child. Most of all, it depends on the Lord. Okay? The, it's known as the age of accountability. Whenever that age is, there is no specific age. It is dependent on the person, spirit, soul, and body, and the Lord. Okay? When they are told, understand that, wow, God said not to do that, and we're doing that. But mommy and daddy say it's okay, so I'm going to do it, even though this says, yeah, they're accountable. They are made aware of the truth. And is daddy and mommy teaching them that truth? Or is it that the Jesuits from the uh, school systems get your kids out of school parents you teach your children at home but then again if you do that that would overthrow a lot of what the Jesuits want with their ridiculous colleges and stuff right yeah. Yeah. But what happens when things, uh, when you disregard, huh? When you disregard God's method of raising children? Proverbs chapter 30, verses 11 on to verse 17. Think about this, brethren. There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. Think about what we started with in Deuteronomy chapter 21. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation Oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, and the needy from among men. 
nowadays too, we think it's so cute when you see a little child cussing, speaking as an adult, influenced through television and through a uh, mommy and daddy who don't say that, don't say that, but they, <laughs> it's cute. No, it's disgusting, it's vile. Getting cussed out by a 12-year-old using such profane things, it's smack that little kid myself. Can't do that, of course, because you go to prison, right? <laughs> you, you, you tell me, brother, sister, that you have never encountered anything of such nature, of seeing a little child cussing as if they were a sailor. Of course you have. The horse leech hath two daughters crying, Give, give! You coddle the children, give them everything that they ever want without saying a good old-fashioned no. No! The power of no. Can I do that? No. Why? I said so. Why do you say so? You keep asking me, I'm going to smack your fanny. Oh, but see, they'll call it the, the what is it, the Department, Department of Family Services or something like that and get you hauled off to jail. Yeah. Yeah. Creating a self-righteous, arrogant, greedy, lascivious generation of children. <laughs> the horse leech hath two daughters, crying, Give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things say not it is enough. The grave and the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith not it is enough. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles, eagles shall eat it. Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Verses 1 on verse 14. Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 on verse 14. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with the covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. that walk to go down into Egypt. Remember, for our instruction in righteousness, Egypt is likened unto a type of the world, okay? And have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Now, think about that in context to today. God, and, I, and, I, and again, Using my nation as the example, God has been far removed out of the equation. And people go, and parents seem to go to who? Catholicism, the Jesuits, to raise their children. From the hospitals to psych, uh, child psychology books. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. And that cover with the covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. That walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, for our instruction and in righteousness within the Old Testament. Pharaoh, likened unto Satan. And to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, 
and the trust and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion keep this in mind with the parents the you know daddy and mommy that are raising this generation today and also two of the uh, single father single mother usually it tends to be a single mother and if okay these Christian church buildings are they reaching out to these single mothers and if they are what are they reaching out with God loves you so many things are lacking nowadays aren't they and they just getting worse but we mustn't brethren be so taken aback when we see it Because exactly that, the people of today, their shame is that they are in league with Satan. And the shadow of the world is their confusion. For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them nor be in help nor profit, but a shame and also a reproach. The burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. Hmm. How much, it costs a lot of money, apparently to go to a hospital to bear a child. Also costs a lot of money to get the things necessary uh, for the raising of children according to world standards. And think about this brethren. A child being born today, right now, today, in a hospital You know. They give them. They give them injections, right? You know that they're giving them kids the death shot. And that's something. And that. Uh, a daddy and mommy out there who go to a hospital, a Jesuit hospital, and get their kid, uh, you know, stabbed with everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That ought to bring tears to our eyes. Like I said before, these Jesuits, they're going to get what's coming to them. Verse 7. For the Egyptian shall help in vain, and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. Now go. Write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, turn out of the path, cause, uh, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall. 
swelling out in the high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at, at, an, at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a sherd to take fire from the hearth, or to take water withal out of the pit. At any given moment, especially here in America, all things can, could, could collapse just like that. Just like that. And what's going to happen to these people when this happens? And because there is a generation who are pure in their own eyes, and taught evolution in school, that evil is good and good is evil, sodomy is okay, marriage is as a disposable razor, and God is who you make him to be. And ten times out of ten for the lost people, it's the God that they're looking at in their, in their own mirror themselves. Have you, have you done that to an atheist yet? I don't believe in a God. You lie. You do believe in a God. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. It's the one you're looking at in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look at an example of this. Go to 1 Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 on to verse 17. Eli, Eli, who was a judge, a priest, okay? Again, remember, why do you think the Lord allowed the people of Israel to go cannibal and to eat their own children? The same children that they sacrificed onto devils to benefit themselves. Let's look at this. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 on to verse 17. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. Remember, Eli was a judge and a priest. They knew not the Lord. Eli, a judge, a priest, should have brought these kids up. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth. Greedy? Then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now. I want it now! Coddled, spoiled, the horse leech hath two daughters crying, Give, give. And if not, I will take it by force. What happens to a little child when he doesn't get his way? He throws a temper tantrum, doesn't he? You have to teach a child what is right and what is wrong, don't you? Think about this. Think about this, people. Okay? Think about this. If a child, you know, a child were able... 
not knowing anything like of good or evil. But if you said no to a child, that you know, like a little baby, all he wants, all he or she wants is his bottle or her bottle, right? You don't give it to them, they get angry. They don't know anything about composing themselves, what is right and wrong. If they were, were able, wouldn't they go through you to get what they want? So see, it is up to daddy and mommy to bring up the child in the way they must go. And how did Eli, who was a judge, priest, apparently he didn't do too well with his own sons, did he? Verse 17, Wherefore the sins of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord because of the conduct and sins of the sons of Eli, who should have known better. But of course, verse 16, Then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now. Hmm. I wonder if Eli ever corrected his children when they were young. Verses 22 on to verse 25 now. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto Israel. And how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is, not, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord... Who shall entreat him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Going, talk about going past the point of no return. But then again, in his correction of him saying something to his sons, it was almost kind of passive, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Then again, he was old. His sons could have probably become physical with them? We don't know. It's safe to assume that. But now look at verses 29 on to verse 30. The Lord admonishes Eli and warns him about destruction coming to his house. And that he's not going to have a man for him and stuff like that. Okay? Verses 29 and 30. In Second Samuel, First uh, Samuel, chapter two, wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me. Oh boy, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Look at verse 29. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice, and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me. Oh boy. To make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Honorest thy sons above me. What does our Lord say? About loving your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your wife, your children, above him, can't be his disciple? God's got to be number one. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, has to be number one. You have to love him above everybody, including yourself. And you need to put the Lord first, 
even before your children? And honorest thy sons above me. Do you think that the children of Israel might have been honoring their children before him around the times around the time of the siege in Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar came and whooped the snot out of them and during that siege they were given in onto cannibalism we also see that uh, during the ministry of Elisha uh, the one woman cried unto the king about how they boiled her son because of the siege Now think about that. And today, especially, they have all these uh, stipulations for the kids, for the children. But see, the Jesuits, that is who they are going after to get them to make them soldiers in Satan's army. And a lot of people today have made little idols of their children. Case in point, look at that, what is it, uh, John Benet Ramsey uh, stuff. I don't know if you know about that. Look that up on your own time. About a mother and a father. Note how I did that backwards. Mother and father instead of daddy and mommy. Which is the way it should be. Father and mother, not mother and father. See that? Okay. But the John Benet Ramsey case. Look that up on your own uh, time about how they made this little girl a pageant something. She wasn't even 10 years old, apparently. And what happened? Because of the favoritism. Her brother hated her and stuff like that. It was just, it was just a mess. And today, <laughs> look at what the lost world and these Christians are making idols of their children. Verse 29 again. And honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel my people. See, they want to live vicariously through their children. So at the end, they might be living comfortably because of how successful their children do. Mm. Got a little um, hidden agenda there, do you, buddy? Go to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. Verses 13 on to verse 20. Check this out. A foolish son, the fool has said in his heart, is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are continual dropping. Foolish son, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And the contentions of a wife are continual dropping. Is a wife to be contentious? Contending? Fighting with her husband? All the time? And the contentions of a wife are continual dropping. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers. See, father. The mother are to lay up for the children. Not the other way around. And a prudent wife is from the Lord. Now note the contrast here. Okay? Okay? A prudent wife is from the Lord. Whereas in verse 13, the contentions of a wife are continual dropping. Okay? Note that contrast. A prudent wife. What is prudence linked onto? The fear of the Lord. Okay? And... House and riches are, in it, are the inheritance of fathers to give on to the children, obviously. Let's continue. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, 
and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. He that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul, but he that despiseth his ways shall die. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given he will pay him again. Note again the way of uh, the the godly way of living here in these verses that we are looking uh, for. The warning about slothfulness, about keeping your soul. Remember, uh, in this dispensation, body and soul were connected. Okay, that circumcision made without hands was not there. Okay, eternal security was not there during this dispensation. Okay, when this was written, keep that in mind. Okay. He that hath pity upon the Lord, or upon the poor, lendeth unto the Lord. Note these instructions on how to live godly. Okay? And that which he hath given will he pay him again. Verse 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope. And he's young. See, uh, the kids of uh, Eli, you could pretty much say they were beyond that age referenced here in verse 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Chasten thy son. Chasten thy son. You know, it's like, see, go pick yourself a twitch. You done bad. You done wrong. You done evil. Okay, you've been acting not according to the scriptures like daddy and mommy have been telling you. Okay, you go, you you go get yourself a twitch, little boy, little girl. You go get yourself a twitch. Okay? Yes. Chastening your children. But there's a warning in verse 19. A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. For if thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. Now, most of the time, uh, you would imagine if you were chastening your son, your daughter, that you wouldn't have to go and do it again. But that's not the case, is it, sometimes? And think about our walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, a new creature. Lord's like, don't do that. Don't touch that. Don't, don't do that. I told you. Okay, touch it. You touch it. You burn yourself. You get hurt. Then he levels upon you quite a much, a little bit of chastening. Don't do that again. And what do we do? Sometimes. What do we do as saved sinners? The Lord told you not to grab that hot plate. Are you still grabbing it? A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. Okay? And remember, Paul warns about... Um, well, let's look at that again. Okay, hold your place there. About Paul's admonition. Go to Ephesians. Again, chapter 6, verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay? That doesn't mean you do not chasten them. No. But see, daddy, mommy, ought to be at first, of course, themselves, as hearing, living their lives according to the scriptures, not the dictates of the devil. Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. Chasten thy son while there is hope, verse 18, and let not thy, sp thy soul spare for his crying. Why? Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. 
a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That works both ways. Whether you're bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, according to the scriptures, or according to the dictates of the world, which is run by Mystery Babylon the Great, Roman Catholicism, and her army, the Jesuits, the Jesuit order. Isis, Horus, Set. Okay? Go to Jeremiah chapter 44 now. Jeremiah chapter 44. See, Satan in the Garden of Eden, who did he go after? After Eve. And the woman, the wife, is to be the keeper at home, to guide the house, okay? While the husband, the man, goes out, makes a living, and does what the Lord will have him to do. But see, Satan goes after the woman to mess up the order of all things. And then you bring in feminism. Oh boy, that, that turns everything up on its head. And the result of feminism, especially in America, <laughs> okay? But here, note this. Note this. Jeremiah chapter 44, verses 15 on to verse 23. Okay? Quick backstory. Nebuchadnezzar comes, whoops the snot out of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar puts in Gedaliah, the son of Shaphan, or what? Gedaliah, okay? And then Ishmael comes, kills him, and then Johanan and all the proud guys chase him off. And then they come to Jeremiah, hey, pray to the Lord for us. And whatever the Lord says for us to do, we're going to do. They said that kind of tongue-in-cheek because they wanted the Lord to bless what they wanted to do. They had no intention of doing what the Lord wanted them to do. And then they said to Jeremiah, oh, The Lord hasn't said for you to tell us not to go down into Egypt, but Baruch, the son of Neriah, said the Theon against us. And they go down to Egypt like the Lord told them not to do. But see, they went to Jeremiah hoping that the Lord would bless what they want to do. When it's supposed to be the other way around, see. So they come into Egypt against what the Lord clearly told them not to do. Here's something very telling. And this is after that Nebuchadnezzar came and just whooped the snot out of them. After all of that, Check this out. You, you ought to know, this ought to be very familiar unto many of you. But Jeremiah chapter 44, 15 on verse 23. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods. Let's read that part of this verse again. Then all the men, so-called, which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods. See, bone of bone, flesh of flesh. The Lord is supposed to be the head of the marriage. The Lord is the head of the man. The man is the head of the woman, okay? Daddy and mommy raised the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And these men knew that their wives burned incense onto other gods. Yeah, some kind of union that they had there, isn't it? Right away, telling you something. And all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, note how it says, and all the women were seeing a scriptural example of feminism, of woman controlling men. Like I said, I'm going to link those other videos about the woman of God in this video for yourself. So, 
Verse 16, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us, in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the Catholic Mary, the Queen of Heaven, the Catholic Mary. Not the Mary of Scripture, but the Mary of Catholicism, the Queen of Heaven. That's who that's talking about. Okay? But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our mouth to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, pay attention, and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Drink offerings unto her. Like the wine that becomes blood because of the hocus pocus of the Jesuit priest. Come on, people. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals, and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, the Catholic Mary, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things, and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven, the Catholic Mary, and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? The perfectly round, sun-shaped bale cookie? It's right here in Scripture. So yeah, you satanic Catholic Jesuits, yeah, there's, there's your religion right there. And, and, and note verse 19. And pour out drink offerings unto her without our men. See, the men were behind us. They were, yeah, they, they knew we did that. Like it says in verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods. But yet the men were passive. Why? Because the women were the ones ruling behind the scenes. Feminism had uh, crept in. God's order had been uprooted. Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men, and to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer, the incense that ye burned in the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings, and your princes, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them, and it came, and came it not into his mind? See, you Catholics, by the way, you think you think all that palaver that you're doing at the dictate of the Jesuit order, Roman Catholicism, you know, Mystery of Babylon, you think that you're serving the actual God of the Scriptures, you are, you are insane. You're not. And unless you repent and the Lord save you, God is not going to forget what you have done. saved. Verse 22. So that the Lord could no longer bear. Now stop. God's long suffering is going on right now as we speak. When he can no longer bear. Come up hither. You know, the long-suffering of the Lord, when you actually think about it, man, it, we can define it through Webster's. We can look at it as defined within the Scripture. But actually knowing the long-suffering of the Lord, look at what he's putting up with. 
His long suffering. And by the way, there's a difference between patience and long suffering. Okay? Look at what he's <laughs> suffering long with. Verse 22, so that the Lord could no longer bear that the sin of this world just gets so bad that our Lord can't take any more of it? See, you and I, we're like, what are you waiting for? That's a testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ, of his long suffering, his mercy, his kindness. Because like I've said to you, aren't you glad, speaking of course unto the church of the living God, that the Lord waited, uh, uh, that the Lord didn't uh, call us all up before he saved you? The Lord had called us up uh, about 20 years ago, I'd be in hell. Who did the Lord save today that he didn't save yesterday? Always, always keep that in your mind. Please. Please. It's not just about us. Remember that. Let's continue. So that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which ye have committed. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as it is this day. Because ye have burned incense and because ye have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord nor walked in his law nor in his statutes nor in his testimonies. Therefore, this evil has happened unto you as at this day. Because the world has rejected our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the Gospel, and the Scriptures. We know that. We know that. But see, right here, that order being turned up. Look what happened. Look what happened. Look at what happened. And these mommy and daddy people here training their children in the way they would go. And they were in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. 70 years. About the time of a generation, wouldn't you say? That a generation brought up in captivity. And then you look at Ezra, Nehemiah. Those returning from the captivity. And the revival that happened under Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay? And note too that it was that the revival was at the hands of who? Because uh, onto who? The Jews. Okay, there's no revival happening today. Okay? Just so you know. Okay? Now go back to 1 Samuel. Go back to 1 Samuel. Another example of this. 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Verses 1 on to verse 6. Now, Eli. Okay? We saw the example of his sons. Okay? He didn't bring them up right. Never corrected them. What not. Eli was not only a judge, but a priest. But then again, his house was cursed because of what he allowed his sons to do. What about Samuel? Samuel, the great, a judge, a prophet, who anointed King David, who anointed King Saul. Amen. A true man of God, a true seer. But there was something in the life of Samuel that I'd like us to note. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 on to verse 6. Now remember, Samuel was a judge, a priest. And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons 
judges over Israel. Now the name of his first son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. So wait, 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 whoa, whoa, hold up. So, what, Samuel? His own kids? What was happening? Well, the thing about Samuel is, you've got to remember, he was a very busy man. A consequence, you could say. A consequence of not, you know, the Lord used Samuel mightily, but then again, his own children were not as he. Then again, the whole thing of a king, prophecy, so on and so forth, yes. But something to be reminded of. That one can lose himself in the work of the Lord and neglect certain aspects of his own life, meaning his children. Who knew the, who knew the Lord better at this time than Samuel? Lord spoke to Samuel. Samuel, Samuel, you know, when he was a little child himself, the Lord came and stood by him. And I said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel would go on to Eli. It's like, what? You called me. And then that happened a couple times. Eli was like, oh, he says, hey, 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 whoa, whoa. Lay down again. And if he call you, say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Okay? Samuel, man of God, but yet his own sons, his own sons didn't walk in his ways. But yet he, one of the greatest of the men of God ever, one of the greatest. Hmm. Something to keep in mind. Verse 4, Then all the elders gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, Thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Let's keep reading on to verse 9. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should reign over them. So this right here also shows us, too, that there was a little bit more to Samuel's sons. Okay, It wasn't just the fact that Samuel neglected them in some fashion. Okay, that you could make a val yes, that might, yeah, I believe that's there a little bit. But the more important thing is what the Lord says unto Samuel about that. Because they say, they bring up, your sons walk not in thy ways, so your sons can't carry on after you. So that means we need a king like the other nations. So see, it's deeper than just Samuel not being there for his own kids. Okay, it's a little bit deeper than that. But let's continue. Verse 8. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice. Howbeit yet, Protest solemnly unto them, and shew them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And of course, the king, which would come David, which eventually of the line of David, the son of David, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the king of the Jews. Okay? Okay? But now, also to remember too, King David himself, 
because of his sin with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah the Hittite, okay, with the sword of the enemy, how Absalom, his own son, came and uh, tried uh, took the kingdom uh, out from under him as judgment upon David for what he did, and also Adonijah, Adonijah, okay, look at that, King David when Adonijah said, "I'll be king." King David never admonished him. There is evidence to suggest that King David really didn't really didn't give all that much attention onto his children, even though he did, and fasted for them and stuff like that. Yes, 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 yes. Let's keep that in mind also to remember, okay, about King David. But also too, go to now Second Kings. Second Kings chapter twenty. Second Kings chapter twenty. Second Kings chapter twenty, verses one on to verse seven. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, a godly king. A king who did many great things, many great things, who was the son of King Ahaz, King Ahaz, and you can read about him in 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Hold your place here, let's go there, okay? King Hezekiah was the son of King Ahaz. 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 1 on to verse 4. In the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years as old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass, look at that, to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Burnt his son in the fire. Burnt his son in the fire. Sacrifice his son so that it will benefit him. Yeah. And King Hezekiah, he was the son of Ahaz, okay? But now, let's continue in verse, in chapter 20 of 2 Kings, okay? In those days Hezekiah was sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amaz, came to him, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall, and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, Remember now how I walk before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Now, think about this. You and I, Church of the Living God, we die, we're, we're going to go be with the Lord. Why would you want to stick around here? Why? Do we love this world so much? Is our little posh or our little lives that worth staying around to when the Lord is like, you're going to die, boy. Hmm? Apparently on the King Hezekiah, sticking around was something worthwhile. <clears throat> I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now, verse 3, how I walk before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. Hezekiah wept sore, the mercy of the Lord. And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Turn again, and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days 
15 years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. So the Lord healed I, um, Hezekiah, okay? And this was, and this was after, this was after Sennacherib came to, um, uh, came to King Hezekiah and did all his uh, propaganda and psychological manipulation uh, to the Jews that were on the wall. This was after it, okay? The Lord gave Hezekiah 15 years. And once the Lord healed him, ambassadors from Babylon came. And King Hezekiah boastfully is like, hey, look at all my stuff. Hey, look at this. He was proud. His pride got the best of him. And because of that, punishment, chastisement was coming upon his sons. You know, because he warns them, he warns Hezekiah that his children will be eunuchs in the land of Babylon. Daniel and all those types of guys, okay? Daniel, I guess you can also uh, reckon him onto Hezekiah, okay? That I'm not too sure about. Uh, fact, check that on your own time. But the point we're getting at is 15 years that the Lord gave unto Hezekiah, okay? Hezekiah's pride got a little out of control. And he had a son who would take over the kingdom in his stead. Now, Hezekiah was a godly king. Hezekiah is in heaven. But the child that came after him, who was that? King Manasseh. King Manasseh. Let's read a little about King Manasseh, shall we? Verses 1 on to verse 9. I've, I've covered this before. I have covered this before, but very pertinent, okay? Very pertinent about bringing children up in the admonition and nurture of the Lord, okay? Hezekiah, a godly king in heaven, okay? Yes. Given 15 years, and during that 15 years, King Manasseh was born. Okay? King Manasseh was born. King Manasseh was the one given to unto the kingdom. Okay, he's he's the one who reigned after his father Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a godly king. But King Manasseh was born in that 15 years. And in that 15 years, yes, Hezekiah humbled himself, but his pride got the best of him. And we can see that represented in how uh, Manasseh lived. Now, we all know Manasseh repented and did his best to turn things around. But see, the thing too, you got to remember about Hezekiah, Manasseh, okay? Man Verses 1 on to verse 9. We'll get to that thought in a second. In uh, 2 Kings chapter 21. You can also check this out in 2 Chronicles chapter 32 in reference with chapter 20 uh, in 2 Kings and also 33 in reference with chapter 21 here in 2 Kings in 2 Chronicles, okay? But Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. 12 years old. So that means within the 15-year time span that the Lord gave to Hezekiah is when Manasseh was born. And his mother's name was Hephizabah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. His, his daddy was Hezekiah. This guy who was given 15 years. His pride got out of control. But a godly king. Where was Hezekiah 
Did Hezekiah bring uh Apparently not! Did he? Did he? King Manasseh. Godly King Hezekiah who is in heaven. And also I do believe that King Manasseh is in heaven because of his repentance. Okay? Yes, I believe that as well. That Manasseh is in there. Is in heaven as well. But! This godly King Hezekiah. Godly King. Did, what influence did he have on Manasseh? Apparently very little. Or was it because it was during that 15 years where the pride of Hezekiah got the best of him? Let's continue. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. And he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did Ahab, king of Israel, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. Also, too, it says here that his mother was his Hephizabah. Is it possible that Manasseh was raised strictly by his mother and by other people? Mm. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son pass through the fire and observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of the grove and he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house, of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen, out of all the tribes of Israel will I put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I, have, which I gave their fathers. Only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to all that the Lord, that the law, and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they hearkened not. And Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Big part, brother. So, where was Hezekiah during? during the upbringing of Manasseh, that would, Manasseh would come in onto the throne to do such wickedness. Hmm? Apparently, King Hezekiah apparently didn't do that much in the raising of Manasseh. Or if he did, during this 15 years, Hezekiah Manasseh, okay? Hezekiah was a godly king, but Manasseh, his son, was a wicked king who eventually repented and is in heaven, I believe, today. But now put that in contrast to what is going on today. You got mommies and daddies, not daddies and mommies, mommies and daddies here in America, okay? Making idols of their little children pampering them. Not correcting them. Not, ch uh, not chastising them. Raising them up in the nurture and admonition of the Jesuit order. And the rest of us are reaping what they have sown. You see, you take God out of the equation and enter the Jesuit, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This is what you get. This is what you get. And the fruit of such, we, we, we see 
all throughout. We're, we're, I mean, look outside your door. The generation that should have taught these children the nurture and admonition of the Lord is not there. But no, rather, they're Christian and not of the Church of the Living God. And if you are a father, a mother, and have a child, have children, you seriously need to get your children out of public schooling, private schooling, because in one way or another, dear friend, the Jesuit order has infiltrated such. But don't think for a moment that your little public school, whatever town you're in, is Jesuit free. You're a fool. You're crazy. No. No. And they, there are people out there, well, Jesuits don't mess with the small fry people. That's not true. That ain't true. That's not true. The Jesuit can be the man at the gas station. Putting your groceries in a bag changing your tire or your oil, okay? Washing your windows. Because remember, the Jesuits want to bring everyone under the headship of Rome. And for centuries, for centuries, brethren, the Jesuit order has been infiltrating all walks of life. <coughs> all walks of life, excuse me. And here, especially in America, especially in America, your children are being taught by Jesuits. And if you call yourself a Christian and you got children in the public school system or even a private school system, okay, think about this. Think about this. The money is more prevalent within a private school, right? You might be thinking, well, there ain't any Jesuit stuff in a, uh, in a private school or something, or in a public school, right? Because they don't mess with the small people. They're more likely to be in the private where the money is better because Jesuits are all about the things of this world, money, okay? But regardless of that, okay, regardless of that, what we are seeing today, brethren, what we are seeing today is the result of the scriptures being tossed out and Mystery Babylon the Great being brought in. That is what we are seeing. And we are too far gone as a people to go back to anything that could resemble lives according to the scriptures for the entire populations of the world. This world is too far gone. God's judgment has to come. The time of Jacob's trouble. Because of all that man has done unto our Lord. Now that doesn't mean that we lose hope. We speak as the Lord would have us to speak. We, of the church of the living God, we walk according to the scriptures. And if you are one out there who have children, have been blessed with those, you bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. See, you, what you did before you were saved as a father, as a mother, you can make a difference now, though. You can make a difference now by leaving them a testimony. Maybe the Lord will have mercy. Because, see, the thing, too, about... you got to remember about Manasseh. Okay, about King Manasseh. Because of King Manasseh's evil, and he reigned for a long time, for 52 years it was, okay, 
he ingrained into that those the people that evil and even when he himself repented and turned and tried to do right the people still went on in their evil even though he himself repented and is in heaven thus that influence of evil that we are seeing right here, right now. And, and you know, brethren, I don't mean to make you feel discouraged or anything, but the fact of the matter is, we ain't seen nothing yet. Jesuit order is going after the children. Here in America, the children are little dress-up dolls for these lost parents to live vicariously through their children so that their children will provide for them rather than vice versa. And yes, it is scriptural for the, for the children to, you know, if you got an, an ailing father or mother, yes, But nonetheless, take heed to these things, brethren. And if you are a father, if you are a mother, and you're lost, and you happen to see this, everything that you're giving to your children is coming to you from the world, which has been allowed to be controlled by Satan. Our Lord Jesus Christ is allowing Satan to do things on earth for his judgment. And once we, the church of the living God, get caught up, we're going to have a heck of a time. going to have a heck of a time. So, that's going to be it for this video, brethren. Um, like I said, this was something that the Lord just put on me about that and it's like I said it stemmed from other from something that a dearly dearly beloved sister sent me and also a comment on the last video and whatnot and Lord just so opened this up so hopefully um, hopefully this might help someone or nonetheless may the Lord Jesus Christ God our Father be magnified that's what's important Thank you so much for watching. If you do, please do not cease to pray for one another, brethren. Pray for one another. As we pray for so many of you, please keep us in your prayer. And thank you to every single one of you, the Church of the Living God, who has helped us. The Lord recompense you mightily. May you have fruit abounding onto your account a thousand. That's going to be it. We love you. We'll see you in the next video. Thank you.